woman felt unwell in the 19th century, the suspected diagnosis would often be hysteria. If a woman was anxious, it was hysteria. Shortness of breath, hysteria. Chronic pain, fainting, showing sexual desire, lack of sexual desire. I think you see where I'm going with this. Even blindness was likely hysteria. Now, the history of hysteria can be traced to ancient times. And the word is derived from the Greek word hystera, which actually means uterus. So the prevailing theory way, way back in the days was that the female uterus wandered around in the body, causing all sorts of problems. Now, this wandering uterus was eventually dismissed as the cause of hysteria, but the diagnosis persisted as a catch-all for women's medical complaints. And it was only removed from diagnostic manuals in the 1950s. Women have often been underserved in medical sciences. And in 1977, a new challenge emerged. From this year, all women of childbearing potential were officially excluded from clinical research trials. The main reason for this was concerns about potential harm to unborn babies after a catastrophic drug reaction caused deformities in thousands of pregnancies. So the intentions behind this ban were good, but the unintended consequences are still being felt today in form of a big black hole in women's health research. No one studied how biology, illness, or treatments may differ between women and men. And it wasn't until the early 90s that people started to address this. But since then, progress has been slow. I work in the field of neuroimaging and brain research. And uh, over the last 25 years, around 43,000 studies on the human brain have been published in scientific journals. How many of these do you think were dedicated to female-specific health, including the menstrual cycle, pregnancies, or menopause? Maybe you're thinking 20%, or even 10%. Well, less than 1% of these studies focuses on female health. The reality is that for years and years, medical science has operated with a male body as the default. But women are not just smaller versions of men. <laughs> we have unique biology and hormones that shape the female brain in ways that male-focused research simply cannot reveal. And while the number of studies on women's brain health is low, the results from these studies are incredibly fascinating. We now know that the female brain changes across the monthly menstrual cycle in tandem with hormonal fluctuations in the body. And as you may have noticed, this influences how women feel and function at a given time during the month. The brain also changes substantially in pregnancy and postpartum. We think that pregnancy prepares the brain for mothering, which makes sense if you think about it. Giving birth and being a mother are very different tasks from a nine-to-five office job. Our studies also show that pregnancies may even leave a lasting imprint on the female brain, one that we can detect decades after childbirth into midlife and older age. Some of you here may also know hot flashes and night sweats, fatigue, brain fog, and extreme irritability. Many women experience these symptoms during menopause. And this transition can also increase our risk for cardiometabolic diseases, which are known to have a negative impact on brain health. 
These are topics that we focus on in my lab because we want to identify the factors that can harm or protect the female brain. We know that some brain regions are especially sensitive to female hormones, like the hippocampus. This brain structure is critical for our memory function, and it is also affected in Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia. Two out of three patients with Alzheimer's disease are women. But because we lack research in women specifically, we still don't know how this relates to changes in female hormones. Now, this problem also extends way beyond my field of neuroscience, and sometimes it's an urgent matter of life and death. Life-threatening conditions, like a heart attack, can progress differently in women and men and also show different symptoms. A study from the Gebhardt lab here in Switzerland showed that women with cardiovascular disease were less likely to be admitted to intensive care units than men, despite being more severely ill. So when we overlook women in research, this creates massive knowledge gaps, and we end up jeopardizing the health of half the world's population. But you'll be glad to hear that there is hope for the future. In science, I'm really proud to be part of a strong international movement for more women's health research. Funding institutions are slowly starting to come on board too. And here in Switzerland, gender medicine was recently announced as one of the four national research programs. And this is promising for women's health funding and priority going forward. But science isn't something that just happens in isolation at the universities. Scientific progress can be driven by what we, as a society, decide is important. Now, one example of this is the recent shortage of HRT, or hormone replacement therapy. And HRT can be extremely helpful for alleviating menopause symptoms. In some countries, the demand for HRT has more than doubled over the last years due to campaigns, media coverage, and increased public awareness about menopause. So while this shortage obviously is a big problem, menopause treatment is now on the agenda like never before. And this puts pressure on governments to find solutions including research on alternative treatments, which naturally involves scientists. So what more can we do? Healthcare providers help us bring women's health out of the shadows and into the clinics. Ask questions. Listen to women. Encourage knowledge exchange between patients, clinicians, and scientists. If we work together, we increase our chances of changing and even saving a patient's life. Women, keep your eyes open for research that you could participate in. And if you experience side effects of medication, you can report it to the pharmaceutical companies. Your data matters. Awareness matters too. And even though our conversations about women's health are already starting to shift, there are still so many women out there who lack essential support and knowledge about their health. Some of you may know the silent agony of extreme period pain or the shame that comes with perimenopausal symptoms. Maybe you've experienced the hidden grief of a miscarriage or been overwhelmed by new motherhood, but on the outside, and especially on social media, everything is fine, our baby is healthy. Were you healthy? Every time one of us opens up about something, we're likely to help someone else simply by having the courage to share. If you spread awareness, 
you might take part in a chain reaction that eventually leads to societal transformation. Men, there is no doubt that these things affect you too. And it helps so much when you check in, ask questions, and contribute to normalizing these conversations. Thankfully, women are no longer diagnosed with hysteria for every health concern. We have moved beyond outdated ideas like a wandering uterus. But the real reasons behind women's health concerns can only be revealed if we turn our attention to them. And together, through more funding and research, as well as our conversations, involvement and advocacy, we can create a better future for women's health. Thank you.